Thanks, Sheila. You can see why he's the boss now, right? Um, but thank you for inspiring us and also for making me cry again every time. Not not because of your, your photos when you were younger. That, that's not what made me cry. Um, <laughs> Although those may come back to haunt you sometime, brother, but, uh, but to see uh, the kind of passion that he has uh, to combat this disease while facing it himself. You know, as, a, as I've often said, as a myeloma physician, to have a boss as a myeloma patient is a very unique scenario, a unique situation, one that I'm, I'm very grateful for. Uh, so thank you, Yellick, for inspiring us. Now, I know many in the crowd here today and, and learning about the crowd at Grace Baptist, that, that many of you know a lot about myeloma and many of you are still actually quite new to this whole concept of myeloma. And so we've actually just launched a series called Myeloma Made Simple. So if you want to nap for the next few minutes, you can always uh, go online later to myeloma.org and uh, watch the videos that we've made, although I apologize, you have to look at my face throughout them. But nonetheless, um, you can learn a little bit about myeloma because one of the things that, of course, happens with us in medicine is that we have a whole different language and we can make things re very, very complicated and difficult to follow. But we want to make sure today uh, that things are straightforward for you. So let me start in, with the real basics, right? And whether you've, you are an expert in myeloma, you can use these analogies and use this approach to, uh, to chat with others. Or if you're new to it, let me explain the basics of blood. So the blood is actually an organ. You don't normally think of it as an organ. You think of an organ like a heart or, or kidneys or a pancreas, but the blood itself is an organ. Of course, being a hematologist, we think it's the coolest organ of all. Like, I mean, like what, what use is the heart if it doesn't have blood to pump, right? I mean, honestly, right? So, okay, that was a joke. You're, allow you're allowed to laugh, right? Okay. Um, but this organ is made up of two things, right? You've got the stuff, uh, which we call cells, and then there's the liquid bit, which we call the plasma. And the cells um, are of three types, um, a red, white, and platelets. In some contexts, I've said red, white, and rosé, but that's uh, for another day. Uh, but we have red cells, we have white cells, and we have platelets. Red cells are just those cells that carry oxygen in the body. So they're, they're, they're basically, as I call them here, like little red trucks. They come to the lungs, they pick up the oxygen, the air that we breathe in, they go deliver them to the tissues, and then they come back for more. I'm systematically offending every hematologist in the world, but that's basically all that red cells do. They just uh, carry oxygen to and from the lungs. White cells are a little bit more complicated, and this is where we're gonna dive in a bit deeper in a moment, but white cells are basically like your army to protect you. They are uh, soldier cells, as it were, and interestingly, they're basically five kinds of white cells, just like we would have five branches of the military, and so these are the cells that protect you and fight for you uh, as part of your immune system. Platelets are just tiny little cells uh, that I sometimes call the ambulance because if you cut yourself, they're the first ones to get there. And they sort of plug up the hole. If I were to cut myself, they get there, they plug up the hole, and then they kind of make a phone call or bring you to the emergency department, as it were, where your factors uh, can form a much stronger blood clot. Again, I'm now offending all the blood clotting experts in the world, but, but that's really the simple way of thinking about your blood. And these three cells and the liquid that carries them, that plasma, is made inside what we call the bone marrow, which is really our blood factory. And so sometimes when we use phrases like blood cancers or blood diseases, often it's a function of the factory of those blood cells, which is inside our bone marrow. So most of the bones in your body inside of them have an area that's a factory of your blood. We tend to think of the, the bigger bones in our pelvis and maybe even in our sternum and in our spine, but actually in many places, other places throughout your body, you're making bone marrow at any given time. So, so on the one hand, we have blood. On the other hand, we have, sadly, cancer. I mean, what is cancer in its, es in its essence? I always just try to identify it with three words. Identical, uncontrolled growth. It's just easier to conceptualize a, a piece of lung tissue or a piece of breast tissue that is just growing out of control. But when we talk about multiple myeloma in a minute, we're gonna talk about identical, uncontrolled growth. And so your body has this balance to make sure that your cells and your organs don't grow out of control. They're meant to grow in an orderly manner. You know, as you're growing older, we have a, a few beautiful ch children running around here today, and you see them as they, as they grow uh, bigger and bigger. 
some of us grow bigger in different places, but that's another discussion. But um, as, as we grow, your, the body has a way to regulate to make sure that that lung tissue or that breast tissue or that, that uh, colon tissue doesn't grow out of control. But unfortunately, when that system gets imbalanced, when there's something wrong with those very cells that are growing, sometimes they, they have what we call mutations or genetic challenges that end up having those cells starting to be independent of their surrounding, and they, they start growing, as you can see, in an identical manner, in an uncontrolled way as they grow. And so when we talk about blood diseases or blood cancers in particular, it's a bit of what I call the double whammy because it's one thing to, to have and not to make light of anything else, but it's one thing to have lung cells that grow out of control or breast cells that grow out of control. But now if we have blood cells that grow out of control, those are the very ones that are meant to protect you. Those are the ones carrying the oxygen. Those are the ones being your immune system. Those are the ones stopping you from clotting. Now if those become the problem, now it really can be an issue with the body. So the very immune system that protects us is now potentially attacking us. And that's the challenge that we see in blood cancers in general. So multiple myeloma then, in all of the blood cancers that we hear about, lymphoma, leukemia, those different blood cancers, we have multiple myeloma. And multiple myeloma is a cancer of what we call the plasma cell which is a cell that lives in the bone marrow, that whether or not you know this, you've been talking about plasma cells for the last three years. Every time you refer to a vaccination, every time you refer to COVID and all these things that we've been dealing with the last several years, because these are the cells that make antibodies, which means if I get a, a, a flu shot today, if I get a vaccine of any sort, the COVID shot or whatever shot I get, that message gets sent to my plasma cells. My plasma cells answer by making something that we call an antibody. You know, in medicine, we love to use words that patients don't understand, right? So we use immunoglobulin, but basically it's an antibody, which just means that that antibody protects you so if I get a tetanus shot today, um, hopefully I'm going to make antibodies to tetanus so that if I'm going on one of my runs and I'm happy to step on a rusty nail and tetanus gets into my system, my body can react to it with those antibodies. Well, those plasma cells are the ones that make those antibodies. So you've been calling on your plasma cells. I, I've sometimes joked that, you know, my wife is beautiful, um, but maybe I should get a picture of her plasma cells and put them next to my bed. No, no, I want her picture next to my bed, not her plasma cells. But, but plasma cells are a beautiful thing, right? These are incredible cells. Obviously, I'm a plasma cell doctor, so I'm a bit of a geek when it comes to those. But these plasma cells are so important to our life every day because that's what protects you. And you, ever since you were young, you've been calling on your plasma cells to make antibodies to measles, mumps, rubella, and not even just from vaccinations, but from so many things that you get exposed to over the course of your life. But now, sadly, in myeloma, for reasons that more often than not we don't know, I can't tell you why Yellick developed multiple myeloma. I can't tell you why most of our patients, we know that there are certain things that can trigger myeloma, like exposure to Agent Orange and a few other uh, exposures. But in general, it happens for reasons we don't fully understand. And now these plasma cells, instead of making good antibodies that fight off all these infections, now they make bad antibodies, what we call a monoclonal or an M protein. The monoclonal meaning it's identical. And those very antibodies now start attacking your kidneys and attacking your bones and reducing the capacity of your bone marrow to make those good cells. So myeloma happens in about 36,000 patients, new diagnoses every year here in the United States and tragically takes the life of nearly 13,000 every year. So we, we sadly expect about 13,000 people to die of myeloma in this country just this year alone and perhaps even more, as we're gonna see a little bit later, because sometimes we just don't catch myeloma, and we don't even know that patients may have myeloma. One of the things that's remarkable, as you saw in the life of Yellick just a few minutes ago, is that when I started about 25 years ago as a, as a fellow in multiple myeloma, doing my expert training in it, um, most of our patients lived one or two maybe years with myeloma. Well, now the average survival is actually exceeding 10 years in the majority of our patients. And so it's wonderful to see that we've made tremendous progress, but sadly we're going to see there are areas where we have not made progress. That disparity that Yellick referenced, I'll come to in a moment. You'll hear more details about this later. But one of the reasons why we're focusing the Empower Project the way we are is that myeloma is twice as common if you are of African descent. So it's not a very common cancer in general. It's about one and a half to two percent of all cancers. 
but if you are of African-American background, you have twice the risk of developing myeloma. And sadly, as we're gonna hear a little bit later, that your risk of dying once you have myeloma, your mortality, as we call it, is twice as high than that of a white individual with myeloma. So life expectancy at diagnosis of a black man with myeloma is half that of a white man with myeloma. And so that's one of the reasons why we're, we're uh, attacking it as we're trying to do that today. And part of it is because, you know, patients don't walk into our doctor's offices saying, oh, hi, I've got myeloma. It's not easy to detect. Uh, sometimes it's just fatigue, and most of us experience fatigue on a regular basis, but this is fatigue really out of keeping with what you'd expect. A little over half of patients come in with some kind of pain in their bones because, as I mentioned, it attacks their bones. And if we do some simple blood tests, we don't naturally look for this uh, abnormal uh, antibody in the blood, but if we just do some simple tests, remember I told you the red, white, and, rose, uh, red, white, and platelets, that red cells, the, the hemoglobin, <clears throat> is a measure of your red blood cell count. When that's low, we call it anemia, and that's what patients often experience. But when myeloma affects the body, it typically affects it in what we sometimes call the CRAB, or C-R-A-B, where the calcium level in the blood goes up because it's leaching out of the bones. The renal or the kidney damage that this protein causes, the anemia or the low red blood cell count, or sadly, of course, bone disease where people experience pain. We've added a few more other definitions that, that we need, needn't get into in a lot of detail today, but that's really what myeloma patients typically present with, something of that nature. And without getting into too much detail, what we've learned over the years is that almost everybody with myeloma actually has a precursor to myeloma, something that we might be able to detect sooner. And again, I'm not here to creep everybody out, but like 5% of people over the age of 40, if I look really carefully in their blood, I can find some of that abnormal antibody. Now, thankfully, 5% of the world doesn't develop myeloma. It's a small percentage that do, but it's a sign that something is going wrong and something may go even more wrong in the future. And we call that MGUS, or monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. Yeah, big words, that's why we call it MGUS. And so um, we know that that exists more commonly in African-American individuals, but we know that it's there. And we're doing studies now to try and figure out, should we be looking for this in all patients? Because can we predict who is actually going to be, uh, who, who is actually going to develop multiple myeloma? But ultimately, people develop this true active myeloma. And sadly, although I've just mentioned that we've made huge progress in the disease, sadly, we still don't cure myeloma, generally speaking. It's, it's a joy to see Yellick here today after so many years. Over at Grace Baptist, uh, we have Michael Tui with us, who I showed a picture of earlier, uh, who, who's also uh, had myeloma for over 25 years um, and is, is thriving and doing well. And his wife, Robin, uh, is, a, is a marvelous part of the IMF. They're both a marvelous part of the IMF, supporting patients across the world, frankly. Um, and yet, um, not everyone has that story, as I've mentioned. Sadly, there are still patients that die within a year of their diagnosis. And there are patients that even though they may live longer, unfortunately go through this kind of picture as we see here, where they get treated and they go into what we call a remission, which is not really a cure. It just means we've put the disease asleep, if you will, for a while, but then it wakes up again. And so we have to treat them again. And then it goes back to sleep and then it wakes up again. And sadly, typically in the life of a myeloma patient, every time they go into remission, it lasts just a little bit shorter, a little bit shorter. Now, some of the new treatments, and you're going to hear from Dr. Usmani in a few minutes about some of these new incredible treatments that we think may change this way this picture looks. But sadly, we see this where patients, <clears throat> their disease becomes more aggressive over time. As they're getting older, as they acquire uh, what we call comorbidities, or as we all get older, we have more and more challenges. And so the goal, of course, is ultimately to cure myeloma. The mission of the IMF is to cure myeloma. And until we have that cure to support patients through their journey, that's, that's our essential mission. Uh, but we want to obviously be able to, to cure it. And a step towards a cure is even controlling it, keeping it down for long term. You know, we haven't cured diabetes. We haven't cured high blood pressure, right? But we control them over the long term, and we hope that we can do that. And one of the ways that we're going to be able to do that, and I know that the next two slides are a lot to take in, but I wanted purposely to be a bit overwhelming, because when I start, again, I sound like the old man now, but when I was uh, back in medical school, you know, we had one, maybe two drugs that we used for myeloma, 
And now we have a whole cadre of drugs that we can use for myeloma in all these different classes, what we call immunomodulatory drugs, proteasome inhibitors. We still use some of the older school chemotherapy, uh, monoclonal antibodies. And then as we're gonna hear a little bit from Dr. Ismani in a few minutes, even more uh, uh, new active agents uh, and other ones that are being developed uh, that will very much join uh, this fray in the not so distant future. So, so that's the essence of myeloma. I could bore you all day chatting about myeloma. Obviously, I'm a myeloma geek, as, as we've said before, and I love to talk about this disease, and I want to find a way to care for my patients through it. But as I frequently say, you know, we don't treat myeloma. We treat people. And we care for those patients every day in different contexts. And some of you have experienced this in a first-hand way, uh, much more than any of us could simply reflect on. But it really is um, a terrible disease that has affected everyone uh, that has been involved with it, but affects in particular the African-American community in a much more dramatic way. And one of the reasons why uh, we're excited about the work that we're doing to try uh, and overcome that. Now, in that light, when we care for patients with myeloma, um, it takes a team. It literally takes a village. You know, one of the, 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 as I often quote, the day I got accepted to medical school, my father, who is a physician, my mother is a, is a physician as well, um, he said, uh, Joe, I'm going to give you two pieces of advice. Number one, he said, God made you with two ears and one mouth for a reason. Right? Now, you've got to understand, like I sometimes tease, tease him about it, although my father's passed away now. Sadly, he died of cancer 12 years ago. Um, he was a urologist, right? You know, the plumbers, right? And um, so I'm not sure how much the urologists listen when they're down there, but, but he lived that. He was very careful to listen to his patients. But the second piece of advice that he gave me is he said, Joe, treat nurses like the professionals they are. This was 30 years ago. This was before it was as common to talk about the multidisciplinary team, but he was very much a team player. And you're going to hear today, over the course uh, of the day, as we treat myeloma, it's not just about the, the doctor. It's really a whole team of individuals that we work with to try and overcome this disease. And we work with nurses and nurse practitioners and pharmacists and social workers and physical therapists and occupational therapists, and the list goes on. But also, on the patient's side of the team, we're going to be hearing later that it's not also just about the patient. It's about their care partners and about their support network. And the only way we're going to make a dent in myeloma is if we incorporate everybody in that. And even beyond that, let me suggest, it's about the community in which they live. One of the reasons why we're in a church here, right? We want to have that vision. You know, as, a, as the scripture says, uh, where there's no vision, the people perish. We want to have that bigger picture so that we recognize that when you're facing myeloma, you're not just facing it as an individual or as a family, but as a community. And as we seek to embed ourselves in the community and strengthen ourselves within the community to overcome this disease, it makes a great difference. And that's why, as part of our uh, uh, curriculum today, uh, we've asked Amy Pierre, um, who is a nurse practitioner here uh, in New York at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Center, to come and talk to us a little bit about communication. Um, so that we can hopefully live that reality that my father shared with us, Amy, that we listen uh, as healthcare providers and not just speak, so that the voice of the patient and the voice of the patient's care partner are a part of it. So come on up, Amy. I'm turning it over to you uh, to share with us a little bit about communication in your care. Thank you. 